Hi everyone, I'm Carl from Cedro Alto. This is Coffee Economics with Carl, and today we're actually going to talk about economics. In today's episode, we're going to look at supply and demand and how they come together to establish the market clearing price. This is extremely fundamental information for all the discussions we're going to have from here on out about the coffee price and the market. I can't stress enough how important a thorough understanding of these fundamentals is in order to be able to understand the supply chain and coffee markets and to be able to follow discussions we're going to have in future episodes. If you're at the beginning of a journey to become a great barista, this would be understanding what extraction is. If you're at the beginning of a journey to become a great roaster, this would be like understanding heat transfer. Or if you were learning to drive, this would be like understanding the gas and the brake. The topic may sound dry and complicated, but I promise we're going to take this step by step with coffee related examples to make sure it's digestible for people beginning at any level of understanding. So without further ado, supply, demand, and the price of coffee. Just to get it out of the way from the beginning, when we talk about economics, this is not the study of money. Economics is the study of the allocation of scarce resources, be they money, goods, time, whatever. And so how are scarce resources allocated? And who allocates these scarce resources? Individuals. So what we're really looking at is the personal decisions of individuals. When we get into the behavioral economics and how, and how people's thought processes allow them to arrive to these decisions, this gets into a field of study called heuristics, and is a point where economics and marketing coincide. The field of marketing studies buyer behavior, so the decision to purchase or not purchase, which is one economic decision. Now in economics, we are going to be looking at each individual decision of each person. For a lot of the purposes, we're going to be looking at the aggregates. Since there are so many decisions being made and allocations of resources taking place all the time, there are billions of decisions being made by billions of people for trillions of reasons all over the world. We're going to be looking at the effects of the sum of all of the individual decisions. As we look at the price of coffee, and how prices of goods are set based on supply and demand, we're going to rely on the price theory. And this is the notion that the price of a good is based on the relationship between the supply of it and the demand for it. This is a pretty basic fundamental of almost all the analyses that are out there. This theory is widely proven and holds true in all but very few exceptions. First, let's take a look at demand. So obviously demand has to do with how much people want stuff. But just for the sake of clarity, let's say demand is how much of a good people will buy at a given price level. So let's look at an example. And again, as always, all of the numbers I'm using in these examples are completely fictitious. For example, and this is by no means the case, let's say the price of coffee is $1 per pound. Then let's say the demand is about 10 million tons. Again, don't worry about what form of coffee or what time frame. These are purely examples to show how this relationship between price and demand works. And now let's look at a different price level. Say the price of coffee is $1.2 per pound. Because the price has gone up, certain people might buy less coffee and other people may stop buying coffee altogether. Therefore, the aggregate demand for coffee at a higher price level would theoretically be lower. So let's say at $1.2 per pound, the demand for coffee is then 9 million tons. And so on and so forth. If the price of coffee were $1.5 per pound, the, the aggregate demand for coffee should be even less. Let's say, for example, 8 million tons. And if the price of coffee were to go up even further, for example, to $2 per pound, the aggregate demand would fall again, let's say to 6 million tons. So let's try a diagram to understand this relationship a little. 
his price on the, on the y-axis or the vertical axis and quantity on the x or horizontal axis. So let's say the price is quite high, the quantity demanded will be low relative to lower prices. As the price falls, the quantity demanded increases. So we can see this demand curve with a negative slope, meaning it's descending. The higher price, lower quantity demanded, lower price, higher quantity demanded. Because if something gets cheaper, theoretically, more people will start buying it. The people who buy it may buy more of it. How about televisions? At one time, it was outrageous that a family would have more than one television. But today in many households, because the real price of televisions has fallen so much, many households will have more television sets than they do family members. Now let's take a look at supply. So, so of course supply is how much is being offered. But again for the sake of clarity, let's define supply as how much of a good will be offered for sale on the market at a given price level. Let's take a look at it some examples again. So if coffee is priced at $1 per pound, perhaps 6 million tons would be offered. If the price of coffee were to increase to $1.20 per pound, this is more interesting for sellers and for growers, so perhaps more would be offered to take advantage of the high prices, say 7 million tons. Right now we're just looking at basic relationships and are not going to get into the, the finer details of farming and elasticity at this point. So if that's what's going straight to your head at the moment, then don't worry, we'll get to it soon enough. If the price of coffee were to increase again to one dollar and a half per pound, perhaps more would be offered on the market, say 10 million tons. If it were to increase to two dollars per pound, even more would likely be offered for sale, let's say 14 million tons. And let's take a look at supply on this diagram here. So if prices is fairly low, the quantity offered will also be fairly low as selling at that price will be relatively less attractive to sellers than higher prices. If the price were a bit higher than that initial point, the quantity offered would theoretically also be higher. And so on and so forth. So we can see that the higher the price, the more quantity will be offered. Now that we've got the basics of price theory, the higher the price, the less demand, lower the price, more demand, higher the price, more supply, lower the price, less supply. Let's put these two curves together and see how the market equilibrium price is found. So starting just like on the previous diagram, let's plot the demand curve. So the highest of the four prices will be the lowest demand with each subsequently lower price, quantity demanded increases. So we see this descending curve here. This is demand. Want more when it's cheaper, but when it's more expensive, people generally buy less. On the other hand, we have supply. So at the lowest of the four price levels, we have the lowest supply. As price increases, quantity supplied also increases. And we see this corresponding ascending curve. And this point right here where the two curves intersect is known as the market clearing price where we have market equilibrium so this is the the market clearing quantity and this is the market clearing price the price and quantity at which supply precisely equals demand in a market such as coffee or other perishable agricultural products this market clearing price is very important because all of the product offered on the market on any given day needs to be sold that very same day. And therefore the price must adjust quickly in order to ensure that all coffee that is offered on the market at any moment is immediately sold. These supply and demand curves, and especially this market equilibrium price and quantity level, is always changing. Every time coffee is harvested, 
the supply increases. Every time coffee is purchased, supply decreases. Every time coffee is consumed, demand is created. And every time coffee is purchased, demand is reduced. The number of people participating in the market is also always changing. Harvests all over the world are beginning and ending. Roasters are purchasing based on their projected sales. And that's why the price of coffee is not fixed. Again, this is just the beginning of, a, of an extremely complex topic. We haven't gotten into types of coffee or the many coffee prices that exist simultaneously at all. This is just the most basic, most fundamental piece of the foundation that we're going to need as we get into those more complex topics. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to get into the many types of coffee, the different price discovery and pricing mechanisms, as well as why and how coffee prices change. While there's still a lot to discuss, one thing I can assure you is that it all comes back to the fundamentals of supply and demand and price theory. So I hope you'll join us in the next few videos in this series as we get to the bottom of coffee prices. As always, if this information has brought up any additional questions for you, please feel free to leave them in the comments. And if you're interested in following along as we dig deeper into this subject, consider subscribing. That's it for this episode of Coffee Economics with Carl. Thank you for watching.